Hi, good afternoon, esteemed participants, and welcome to our educational webinar hosted by the International Trade Council. So my name is Anne, and I am your host for today's session. So before we begin, let's confirm our technical setup. Please type in yes in the chat box if you can hear me clearly and the presentation is visible to everyone. Let's take a moment for everyone to respond. So I wanted to confirm again if the presentation and the mic audio is clear. So I do believe that the mic and the presentation is visible for everyone since I I'm seeing here, here in my end. So um, today's session is said to be both informative and engaging for everyone, focusing on seven challenges facing the power industry. What have been your challenges? We will delve into the following key areas. The first one is the data centers are facing extreme stress due to demand outspacing supply compounded by severe weather events threatening their reliability. Second is large industrial power users see soaring costs as demand exceeds supply with new expensive system being implemented. And the third one is the reliability and resilience of the grid directly impact customers' reliability and resilience. So the last one is emerging technologies at the grid edge are enabling power providers and users to make informed decisions that affect, affect their bottom line. It's my honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Mr. Alan M. Ross, the CEO and Managing Editor of APC Media. Alan brings extensive knowledge and insights that we are eager to hear. Without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you, Mr. Alan. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, First of all, we're, we're to cover everything that uh, Anne just talked about right now would take us, oh, let's say a year because there is so much going on in the power industry right now. And I wanna, there's, it really breaks down to two things. Number one, it's people who make power, utilities, generating wind, solar, a lot of different things and people who use power. But you gotta ask, a third and a fourth, and that is people who make money from power. And sometimes that isn't just making power or using it. Sometimes that is in the, the trade offs that go on with power and governmental organizations. And there are many and there's a lot going on. So you really have these, if you think of it as a Venn diagram of these four different areas, and I'm going to try to cover a lot of what's going on by what happens in the center of that Venn diagram, but it's gonna be a lot. One of the, I'm not the expert at power, um, but for the last 20 years of my career, I've been involved with the power industry in one aspect or the other. Primarily, I started in the industrial and commercial world. That would be data centers, hospitals, and people who use power to make things. Um, and so consequently, my experience has been of one not from the utility industry, but from the people who buy and use power. I have certain things that I'll bring, certain biases and certain certain uh, background from that. But in the last five, six years, uh, being the founder, co-founder and CEO of APC Media, we have now focused on the power industry, primarily the United States, Canada or North America and Europe, and we have a growing presence in the Middle East and Latin America. That's given me a different perspective of the people who make and transmit and distribute power. So um, one might say that I, I, I'm able to see both sides of the, the same coin, uh, and what's happening is, is it's affecting everybody. So you may not be in the power industry, but if you turn the lights on and you depend upon electricity to do your job, to make things, 
or to uh, run a data center or, or run a hospital, you need to understand the challenges that the industry is facing because they're your challenges too. And the solutions that the industry is going to apply requires you as an end user to make some kind of uh, decision about your part in solutions. You can no longer just say, oh, that's the power company. So we're going to go through it. And, um, you know, whenever you deal with challenges, it's almost the scary thing. Let me let me scare you. And then and then from there, we'll start to look at some of the um, some of the things that we can do to uh, to fix the problems or to prepare for the challenges. I'm going to kind of wait to the end to talk about some of the things we can do. And I'll intersperse a little bit. Some basically use cases are, are, are what we've seen as people who are, are mitigating these challenges. The first challenge, obviously, everybody knows this. This is a substation. This is a typical distribution substation. It comes off of these great big, huge power lines you see behind these gigantic transmission lines. So when you hear the word transmission, think of tall giants where all of these high voltage power uh, lines are running. That is a problem today that has not been a problem in the past. It's an increasing problem, but you and I can't fix it unless you're with a major utility or you're part of the, the federal government or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That's really the transmission part of the problem needs to be fixed at a higher level. That's why the uh, the uh, the Jobs Act and the infrastructure bill has been so critical because just like if a bridge fails, if a tower fails, power fails. Cars can't cross the bridge, power can't run into communities. So I'm not gonna deal a lot with this, although you can see here, just quite simply, it was built in the 60s for 50 to 60 years. We're at 2020, that's 60 years. We're now at 2024. So we're already aging. And let me tell you, we have not fixed it. And it is not just physical. It's not just that these towers are failing because they were really overbuilt. They're well built. And that infrastructure is something that we can depend on. But what does every tower sit on? It sits on land. And what happens to that land is all kinds of weather events, including fires and other things. So it's a more complex fix than it's been. One of the challenges that is being addressed is by companies like PG&E or Florida Power and Light, who are spending more money in, in the next five years than they have spent in their history undergrounding major transmission lines. Why? Because of hurricanes in Florida. And as we speak, one is just ravaging across the straight state, state. Hurricane Milton, Hurricane Helene just came up through the, um, the panhandle. And it hit Georgia and North Carolina and caused tremendous damage. So if the cables had been underground, we wouldn't have seen some of the destruction. This is a national emergency that needs to be addressed on a national level. And unfortunately, we're in the middle of an election year and politics has gotten in the way. And whatever politics gets in the way, things grind to a halt. It is critical that every American get behind this. But even that's a problem that we'll talk about a little bit later. So if you think about this whole thing right now, large power transformers, and by the way, that's this thing over to the left. Over to the right is a bushing, believe it or not, an oil-filled bushing. But these new orders can take anywhere from 38 to 60 months. When I did this slide originally a year ago for a different organization, I wrote 24 to 36 months. Look what's happened now. And if you're a manufacturer in North America, <clears throat> you're fat and happy right now. But you know, I know them and uh, we're part of an organization called TMAA, the Transformer Manufacturers Association of America. And we can tell you that no one is fat and happy right now, even though our lead times are that high, because it's a problem that we're all facing, especially the data center market. Because what we found is that data centers require more power especially the bigger data centers than ever before. And you cannot rely on the utility to be able to provide that power. So what are some of them doing? They're becoming their own utilities. Amazon, for instance, is creating its own power sectors, bought actually um, major power plants in order to, to provide power to their largest data centers. 
It's happening all over the world. And uh, it, it's going to continue to be a problem as we begin to use more AI, because AI demands more of a data center. And if you demand more of a data center, you demand more power. So even though we've got this wonderful thing, look at the lead times, but that's not just true of transformers. Try to get the kind of replacement cables. These bushings that I talk about, they're in the same thing. They're six, 38 to 60 months as well. <clears throat> they have to supply the transformers, but they have to supply a lot more than transformers. So they're not only retrofitting older transformers, trying to keep them alive, they're also supplying to new transformer manufacturers. There are technology changes in bushing manufacturing. Um, we just, I just did a, an amazing interview with a gentleman named Randy Williams, who will be published on our next, uh, our next APC Media magazine called Transformer Technology. And it is about bushings. And he talks about the history of bushings and where we are now with rosin impregnated synthetics as opposed to oil filled bushings. It is a huge, wonderful technological change, but now we have to adapt it to the marketplace and it's going to take time. So change is afoot. There are answers to it, but you and I running data centers or hospitals or, you know, whatever the commercial is, buildings, a municipality, a co-op buying power, whatever it is, um, we can't fix those things. Those are above our pay grade. But right within our prey grade is weather events because if you can't withstand a weather event in your area and just think of where this one came from this outage right here was actually the houston outage that hit from a hurricane i believe it was five years ago i could have taken this picture yesterday from uh milton or taken it from two weeks ago from helene or pick any hurricane name and you will see this kind of devastation and damage think of how difficult it is to rebuild this this is not the transmission network this is all of these wooden poles and everything you see them in your neighborhood everywhere this is the distribution network and we are part of the distribution network between 20 and 21 83 percent of reported outages or because of weather. So it's, it's an increasing problem. It is a huge problem when you get a lot of the population that believes there is no such thing as problems from weather, even though storms are, are increasing with incredible, uh, incredible, the what, what do we call that? The, the storm surge itself can flood an entire city. And we haven't taken that into account. We think just, oh, you know, it's a lot of wind, it'll go away. They're still dealing with a lot of flood damage all the way up from South Georgia to uh, Northern South Carolina and to Western North Carolina. That will be uh, regional changing. It's gonna take a long, long time. It's not just because of wind, it was because of water. And so we've got a lot of issues that are affecting us there. Being prepared for outages is one of the things we can do, but also being prepared so that the outage isn't our problem. If the outage is the utility's problem, you have to depend on the utility to fix it. But what if you don't have the ability to, to depend on the utility to fix it? What if you were a, uh, a manufacturer in Puerto Rico and every year you get hit with a hurricane or a forest fire and every year Luma Power tries to rebuild your power only to be hit again? Uh, I know the folks who are uh, working at Luma Power, uh, it's a quanta company and they're some of the best and smartest in the industry and they can try to stay ahead of the game. But as soon as they see that next storm coming, they batten down the hatches and they have to be prepared for the next problem. Well, imagine if you were a data center located there or you were a manufacturer located there. And we at one point in time had a lot of drug companies, manufacturing drug companies that were loaded there, located there. If you knew that was happening, it's incumbent upon you to figure out what you're gonna do about it. And there are ways today that industrial sites, that data centers, that small municipalities or co-ops can start to mitigate the distribution problem themselves from weather you're not going to be able to stop the storm but can you be able to do something about it when it comes back if that weren't bad enough we've got this now it this is could be state sponsored 
We know that. We do know that the Russians and the North Koreans and the Chinese and probably the Iranians and the other bad actors as a country like to disrupt things. If you can't disrupt it with a bomb like they've done in the Ukraine, you try to disrupt it this way. You try to get somebody in. And then we have people with pimples sitting in their grandmother's basement doing it just because they can. And that happens all over the place. So you have hackers, you have people that are anti-government, you have people that are anti-anything, progress, and then you have state players. Here's the thing, as the grid becomes more open, and this is a picture of the grid open, we've got smart refrigerators. We've got all kinds of things when you look about EVs and EV chargers. And now it's not just simply power being generated and shipped to all of us, we're generating power and we're generating communications into the grid. Do you know the, uh, I think it was seven or eight years ago, there was a, a breach of credit card breach, one of the largest credit card breaches in the history of credit card breaches until <laughs> five years ago, then we had another one. But you have these constant breaches. That breach was a target breach. And you know how they got into the target credit card system? They got it in through the HVA system. Now, what does the HVAC system have to do with the credit card system? Nothing, except the hackers could get in through the one system and worm their way through and find the security system for the credit cards and then download a lot of that credit card information. And then people had to cancel their credit card, change their passwords, a whole bunch of stuff had to happen. And I was given a free years of credit monitoring. I think I get a new free year of credit monitoring for every hack that happens. But it's happening within the grid and around the grid. And it's happening more often today than it has before. One of the things I, I really appreciate about the power industry, and I'm talking about those who make and distribute power, is they spend a lot of time and energy shutting down and trying to shut down hackers from getting into the grid. I think that in and of itself has become uh, an industry to try to be able to make sure to find the problems themselves and then sh close the loops. So I visited a place in uh, outside of Cleveland and I'm not allowed to say the name, but um, we were shown a room and in the room, it was a huge round table with dark workspaces, multiple monitors and a lot of keyboards. And there were hackers trying to hack the uh, uh, one, in, just one, one large utility company. And they, they were doing it, I think, 18 hours a day. So they would have two shifts doing it. And they were what you would think of as hackers. They were looking down, they were doing dark, dark behind them so they could be uh, concentrating. And they were rewarded for every time they could, they could find a breach. But the minute they found a breach, there was another room and it had a similar thing. And these were people who, once that breach was found, would go to one of these other people and they would shut the breach down. Why did it open up? What was the coding? What did they have to do? And they would immediately try to shut it down. So it was hackers testing the system to be able to protect the system. And then there were another group of people that were finding breaches that they didn't detect, but they did get warnings that there was a breach and they would try to go in and, and limit the damage to that breach. It was a full-time industry. It is a multi-million dollar business. And there's places like that, not just in Cleveland, Ohio, but all over the world. Cyber sabotage is here. If you're an industrial facility and you don't have cyber security, one of my dearest friends has a company and he was attacked, his data was taken ransom and $500,000 later, thank goodness he had a good policy, but he got it paid, it cost him $50,000 deductible. But the worst situation was it shut his business down for about two weeks. Even when he got the data back, it was not all the data in the right place. It took months to get back there. Cyber, cyber size sabotages, there it affects everything and it especially affects power. Here's something that I never thought I'd have to worry about, Duke. In 2022, um, they still haven't found who did this, by the way. Uh, somebody drove a van into the, this substation in Moore County and they shot out some transformers. If you shoot a transformer bushing, I'm not giving anybody any ideas, but when you shoot a bushing, you can cause an explosion. And if you cause the right explosion, <clears throat> the oil in the bushing 
or the oil in the transformer actually explodes, ignites, it becomes a fire and you can't put it out. It just has to burn. So the fire company comes and they mitigate spillage, but they can't put it out. It's just too hot <clears throat> and it will melt the substation. It will take literally years potentially to rebuild or redo it. And if you've ever seen, and if you want to see the impact, just go online at, like at power transformer explosions and you will see about a dozen of them that somebody captured with an iPhone. <clears throat> They're terrifying. And when it happens because somebody with a rifle decided to, to shoot it, it's crazy. It was vandalism. They're, the FBI is involved. They're doing everything they can to catch these people. And they have a good idea who they are. There's a group that are called the, I think the name of it is the Moore County. Yeah, it's the, I'll give the name of it. It's the Moore County Patriots. And there are a bunch of patriot groups who are teaching each other that if you think the government is evil and bad, you need to shut the power down. The backstory on this, there was a drag queen festival, something going on on stage somewhere in Moore County. And there was a lot of people protesting it. But the people that shut this down apparently believed the best way to shut it off was to shut the lights off. And guess what? They did. And, it's, and for whatever the political reason is, it's happening all over the place. And on the web, the dark web, people are being taught where to shoot, how to shoot, what kind of rifle to shoot, et cetera, et cetera. And we have built these substations all over the country in very vulnerable locations. In fact, we didn't think that we would ever have this problem. So we didn't build them with a fortification around them. They're pretty well open, open in spaces. So a lot of what we can do is some sort of prevention besides just sticking up a sign on the fence that says don't enter. That's no longer going to present physical sabotage. Another one that has just gotten, uh, just gotten fixed, or I wouldn't say fixed, but it was um, the case actually went to court. But Hell's Canyon, this is one of the, the finest examples if you're a fisher person, you might not believe so, or an environmentalist, but along this way of this, this river in the Hell's Canyon, they put up hydro dams and the hydro dams supply a couple of states uh, over here, Spokane, a big, bigger city, and then a lot of Idaho, a lot of power generation, generation, distribution, transmission. But they've also built hatcheries and natural gas. They've done a lot to make this a complete system. Well, Somewhere, let me go, I gotta go back a bit. Somewhere along the line, somebody decided a uh, similar kind of a thing, I, I've gotta do something. So uh, a gentleman that they did find by the name is Harold Moore. <laughs> no, excuse me, I'm sorry, I don't wanna say that. Randy Scott Vale. Uh, Harold Moore is a friend, sorry, Harold. But Randy Scott Vale, he was a 50 year old man, got on a motorcycle and drove from up here and drove down and shot out a uh, at one of these hydropower projects at Swan Hills, shot out a transformer or tried to tried to shut it down, but failed to shut it down. Then he kept driving and he sh shot it out again down here, did another one, but he failed. I think he did it at Bennett Mountain. He didn't do the hydro one, but shot it out, didn't work. Came down here and tried it again. Now, that is about a two hour drive on a motorcycle with a gun on his back. Guess what they had along the way? They had video of him doing this all along the way. In fact, they kind of told the story. They called all of the local police areas, but it was different jurisdiction, different states, different federal, local, and they all tried to get here, but they all started up here. So it wasn't that they could kind of stop him. The fear was, oh, he'd get out. Here's the good news. It was a dead end. You can't just drive all the way here and get out. Where he got to, the road ended. So what did he have to do? He had to drive all the way back and somewhere right about in here at Swan Falls, they captured him. So Randy Scott Vale, a 50 year old man was put in prison. He was indicted and he just recently went to trial. That was 1920, no, excuse me, 2023, 2025 it came out. He was sentenced to five years probation. He could have gotten 20 years in prison, but he was given five years probation. And for the life of me, I don't know why he didn't get a prison sentence. He did spend some time in prison waiting for this, but he was also 
uh, ordered to pay five hundred and eighty three thousand dollars. Excuse me. Five hundred and forty six thousand dollars back to the system that did this. Now, I don't think Randy's got that much money. Why? It's because he believed and at his trial, he said, you can't try me because I don't think this is a legitimate government. I am a citizen of the United States of America, not the United States of America. He's a nut. And I'm sorry, Randy, don't come looking for me. But seriously, you, you could have gone to prison for it and you were let off and all you had to do was pay a fine. And if you do it again, you're going to go to prison for five or 20 years. But this is happening all over because I guarantee you, he probably went on the same site that the Moore County one did. He wasn't just unfortunately smart enough to realize it was a dead end road. That doesn't affect you if you make or use power. Well, of course it does. Because if you lose power because of one of these acts, it takes a long time to regain it. Remember what I said about bushings? If they shoot out three bushings and those bushings haven't been made since 1986, they've got to be custom made. There is an incredible company called Crosslink Technology, and they make custom bushings one off. But they didn't, you can't do it in a day because their demand is through the roof. So you're going to have to take the period of time for them to re-engineer, and they will give you a RIS bushing or a rosin impregnated solutions for that or uh, bushing that will be a great solution, but it's not going to happen overnight. Maybe, just maybe with luck, that you've got some spares on hand. So let's move on a little bit. That's that's something that we really that ought to scare all of us and we ought to get behind and stop this political agenda that you know everything is evil and say, you know what? The power affects all of us. As grid, this is the Department of Energy. I love this statement from the DOE. You know, resilience is the fact that we know the power is going out, but what we've got to do is limit the scope of it, limit the impact of it, and when it goes out, rapidly restore it. This is our responsibility at the end of the grid. We can't just rely on the utilities alone to do it. They're dealing with a lot of situations, wind. They're dealing with aging situations. They're dealing with not just wind, but you know, flooding. They're dealing with forest fires in the West. They're dealing with nuts on motorcycles with weapons. They're dealing with a lot of issues. Our job ought to be to help them at the other end and say, we can't just point a finger and say, hey, hey, they need to get the power back on. So think about it. What role do you play? And in that role, there's a lot of things that are changing tremendously. Clean energy creates all kinds of problems. By that, I mean, the clean energy standard is about decarbonization, right? It's about getting rid of coal and uh, companies are getting, countries are getting rid of the last coal plant. I think Britain just shut down their last coal fired plant and we're doing it all across here. And again, politics, well, if you're in coal is a good thing, there is no such thing as clean coal. I mean, come on, let's face it. Is there cleaner coal? Probably, but it's not coal is not the answer. So we switch from coal to natural gas it's still a fossil fuel. It still destroys the ozone, no matter what you say. And it may be natural. It, it's not necessarily clean. It doesn't burn 100% clean. And when there are leaks and problems, because it's a huge system, you are going to have ozone impacts. Uh, natural gas was a great solution and is still a great solution. So don't hear me that I'm against, against fossil fuels. For those of you who think it all ought to be wind or solar, don't kid yourself. We will, in our lifetimes, and I mean everybody on here, including a one-year-old who I hope is listening, but everybody on here, it will not be in our lifetime that you can do away with fossil fuels uh, or carbon-based fuels. Now, we can do a better job with them, and we can do a much smarter job with them, but we need to work together and not make us an oil against clean energy you know, a carbon against clean energy. We need to start to come up with good standards that affect both of us. One of the things I say, and I hate to say it, but it's true, you, no country will fight a war based on clean energy because tanks don't run on electric power. And don't say yet because, oh yeah, if we put enough batteries on them, they will, but you're not gonna be able to charge it in the middle of a battle. So consequently, there are there is a need for a lot of uh, carbon based energy and there's a need for green energy and we need to work together the standards that are coming up are brilliant 
Wind and solar is happening at an increasing rate. Uh, but it's also, it's also complicated because it's not just a federal standard. We have 50 states regulating the power industry in this country. They are power service commissions, PSUs, whatever you want to call them. And there's 50 states regulating, and there's a federal government. There's the, there's the Federal Energy uh, Regulatory Commission. There's the Nuclear Energy Regulatory. We've got Department of Energy. Even the Department of Commerce gets involved. So there's so many policy changes that are happening. It is hard to keep up. And we make it hard for people who are building clean energy because we have so many things to go through. You want to put in a, a, a clean energy facility and you want to put in a, a wind farm, you're going to have to do something about land use. And if somebody doesn't like it in your neighborhood because they don't want to see a wind farm or a solar farm, you're going to have a problem. Offshore, are, they're going to be all kinds of standards. One of the reasons a lot of countries like offshore is they don't have to deal with state regu regulations because if you go a, a certain uh, part out, you're really dealing with dealing with primarily the feds. There are incentives, but if money comes in to incent you to do it, if the money dries up, what'll happen? Will it go away? That's what happened with solar and wind for so long. They made one year incentives. They didn't allow for people to do long-term planning but recently, with the IRA, the investment, the, the what is it, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the stupidest name for something for infrastructure that I've ever heard. But it is doing some incredible things because it's making 10-year plans. So companies can say, now I can put some uh, long-term plans behind it. Grid monitor, this is happening. I got to tell you, I love the power industry because they are coming together in force for grid modernization and smart grid. I used to be a part of the IEEE smart grid program. It is now really more of a grid modernization program. We have a grid modernization. It's called the Grid Edge Conference and Exposition that IEEE is sponsoring with San Diego uh, Gas and Electric out in San Diego in January. The first one was two years ago. Absolutely brilliant conference. There will be AI folks there. There will be communication folks there. There will be all kinds of folks there that you would think have nothing to do with grid modernization, but the world is coming together to figure out how to do this, including data center managers, data center uh, uh, distribution people, production people. So it's incumbent on all of us to do something. With grid modernization comes not just smart grid, which is primarily a utility focus, it also comes the idea that we ought to be thinking about our own grids, how we can be uh, less reliant on the, the large grid transmission, large grid distribution. I'll mention that in a minute. Now we get into carbon pricing and emissions. And, and is there are ways that you can do offsets and emissions regulations. Here's the problem. There are like 10 different state emission regulations or groups of state, California being one of the most uh, regulatory and federal emissions. Well, which ones do you follow? Obviously the one that is at the lowest common denominator, the one that you know if you don't follow it, you're not going to follow the other ones. But we need better uh, alignment, and that is the federal and state policies that we need to get on. And we need to understand it isn't just using money in order to offset carbon things. And carbon pricing is an easy way for people to take their, their pollution and buy a credit from somebody else who doesn't pollute. And does it really solve the problem, or is it just pass money back and forth? I think we need a better job at carbon pricing. Opinion, not fact. Energy efficiency standards have been absolutely amazing. If we can conserve, we don't have to, we don't have to make more power and transmit and distribute more power, and we become less dependent on the power grid. The problem is, is that power demand, even within energy efficiency standards, has been uh, pretty flat for about a decade. In the last two years, it has begun to grow at about a 6% increase. If you extrapolate that over a decade, by 2050, we're going to double, if not triple, the demand for power. We are not in the United States, Canada, Europe. I don't care where you are. We are not prepared for that kind of demand, especially if EVs take hold. But it's not just EVs that do it. It's everything that we use AI and data centers are probably more of a demand on power 
than EVs. They are at this point. Will that always be the case? Maybe, maybe not. I just mentioned that, EV policies. People think that the EV industry is in decline. EV sales are up 13% when you add everybody in. It's just that it's not 80% Tesla anymore. They still sell more vehicles than they did last year, but everybody else is selling some. So it's broadened some. It's just not happening as fast as the industry thinks it is. It's not battery technology, by the way. It's we're all afraid, including me. I rented one and I was terrified every time that battery got below 50% of how I'm going to recharge it. The recharging infrastructure is not in place. Once it gets in place, now you've created even more difficulty for the grid because each one of those is a DC, direct current controlled, as opposed to an AC. It creates its own technological problems and its own technological advances. So a lot of what's happening in the marketplace now is DC controlled. Uh, Mr. Tesla would love that. But the fact that we're all of this is changing is kind of a challenge. It's also something that we need to adapt to. DER, think wind and solar. When you see a wind farm, you see solar, it's a distributed energy resource. And net metering, these are ways of saying it is no longer these carbon developed uh, energy resources, they're coming from everywhere. But they're not just coming from major wind farms and solar, they're coming from my son's roof. He's got a roof in California that's got solar on top. And Southern Cal Energy has to take, when he has excess energy, they have to take that energy in. Their whole metering concept was just to po provide him power, not to pay him for when he provides them power. It's a changing world for everybody, and especially the utilities are having to adapt to it. More regulation, NERC, thank goodness for NERC. They, uh, they are critically important for uh, not just nuclear, but they're critically important for setting regulations and reliability standards. Resilience is getting the power back on when it fails. Reliability is keeping it on before it fails. You can't do anything about wind, aging, all of that, but you can do something about the assets themselves and the systems that operate those assets. And then FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory, they work together where these will set the standards, they enforce the standards. And so consequently, both NERC and FERC are working with the Department of Energy uh, to make sure that uh, we regulate correctly. And where regulation blocks what we're trying to do, to work to be able to limit the effect of the uh, the effect of the ineffective blocks that are just there as barriers. Everybody's got you know California again. They are the leader in climate action plans, but the federal action plan. When we have potentially uh, people within the government that don't believe it's a problem, it is. Integration of renewables. Look at this. The grid used to be make power at some big hydroelectric power plant. Make it send it up somewhere, uh, nuclear here, wherever. Don't send it, none of this was here, and then take it right into somebody's home or take it right into a city or right into a business. Now what we've done is we've added all of these other ways of making and storing power and uh, accessing power. Here's your data center. All of this now makes for a much more step everywhere kind of problem. It does affect grid stability and reliability. Because you need to not just make that the transmission is stable. Now you have to spend a lot more time at the distribution side of the business. You have to spend a lot more time at, at the actual going into the, the businesses and the industrials, et cetera, et cetera. So everything is more complicated when you do this because the power may be coming from here and here, or it may be coming from here. And when the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine, you know what you're going to depend on? You're going to depend on power from here or here or here or batteries. You're going to depend on power from some. So what do you do to make it stable and reliable? You come up with policies and infrastructure upgrades. You need to make sure that it's not the assets that cause the problem. You need to make sure that it's not the software and the system that cause the problem. And you need to make sure it's not you that causes the problem, that you're aware and ready to do it. This is one of the key areas it's not just battery. When you hear me say batteries, I'm not just talking about batteries for car. Energy storage is one of the most exciting areas I've ever I've seen happen. 
I just interviewed a major CEO of a major, one of the top power supply companies in the industry. And by that, I mean, they supply the industry globally. And I mean, one of the top three. And in his conversation, he mentioned the amount of money that they're going to be spending on developing uh, hydrogen technology for energy storage. And his, his mantra is very quite simple, going from the electron to the molecule. So creating green hydrogen with wind and solar and anything else, making it through electrolysis into green hydrogen and storing it in underground containers. So when it's needed, it runs the plant, just like these things runs with these things. Instead of natural gas, run a plant. That's absolutely brilliant. And you know, I think it is the future. Right now, flow batteries, F-L-O-O-W, F-L-O-W, there are new technologies coming out by some of the smartest people. Uh, uh, Envergy is one of them, and they're sold out. And they make utility-scale storage, not using uh, lithium-ion. They're making it out of, out of a different thing. Another company makes them out of vanadium, V-A-N-A-D-I-A-M. That's a store. That's a flow battery that can click back on when the wind don't shine. So utilities can use storage, wind, and solar. And they can mitigate it so you, the renewable energy becomes much more useful to you. But you know what? Every single one of these plants can do the same. You could put an energy storage system in. You could put a grid of your own in with wind and solar. In fact, there's a bakery in California with six plants. A bakery uses a lot of power because it is a commercial bakery. Six plants totally off the grid. They have wind, solar, and storage for each one of their facilities. That is amazing. And they are not a grid. They are not a utility. They're a business that decided to say, we can't let forest fires or, or uh, whatever kind of damages we have. And by the way, they are for the most part, they are earthquake, uh, uh, not prone, but they are earthquake uh, resilient. So amazing things that are happening in the industry need to be part of it. But you need to make sure that there's some, not a regulatory or power thing hurt, that hurts you because they are there. And it might be at your local, it might be in your state, it might be in government. Going back to this, there is an economic impact. The people that make these wind and solar tend to be, dis they tend to be people who are just doing it because they are people that make power and then sell the station back to the utility. Utilities do it, but for the most part, they're developers. And that impact is when they go away, is there enough financial impact to bring somebody else on to, to do it? But, you know, a farmer may not want solar panels. You know, the best place to put solar panels is these asphalt parking lots everywhere where it's so hot on the cars. Put up, there's, there's some great companies out there making commercial grade solar farms on top of uh, parking lots that create power for the business or the building. And yet they also let people uh, park under it in a shady area. And guess what comes under it? You can put EV chargers on. It's a brilliant world. All of that's changing. But you're going to run into these and you're going to run into NIMBYism. Not in my backyard. Walter Cronkite, who since passed away, was an advocate for, for wind. He thought it was one of the greatest ways that, that we could save the planet. Except when we wanted to put offshore wind farms off of uh, uh, his home in uh, Massachusetts, which was on an island, Martha's Vineyard. So he was very much for it until they wanted to put one in his backyard and he could see it from his house. And then he was very much against it. Let me tell you, it happens all the time. Not in my backyard. Don't put a trash dump in my backyard. And here's where economic fairness comes in. Let's not go to the red line areas of the country and put it into the poorest areas of the country and pollute in their areas. You know, we need to be much fairer about what we do and not just let the, uh, the dumps that we create and the problems we create go on the people that have the least power to, uh, to impact it. Technological integration, technology is changing rapidly. Uh, it, is, it is the single most thing that I see that it is saving us because I have never seen such technological integration. My company, APC Media, will be uh, sponsoring four integration awards next year, two in Europe, one for transformer technology, and one for power systems technology, and two in North America, again, transformative technology, and one for power systems. They will be innovation awards for technological or 
systems integration. And then market dynamics, of course, changes. This one I'm going to go through fast because you know this. we got an aging workforce. We need 200 through new workers by 23 in the power industry. Now, think about this. Who wants to climb, climb up a telephone pole? They want to go to college and get an engineering degree as opposed to fly, climb up a telephone. These are the warriors of the power industry. I love and respect these people tremendously. One of the winners of the, uh, it's, it's called the Lineman Rodeo. In uh, I think two years ago, one of the winners of the one of the rodeo events was a woman. I don't have her picture here. I looked for it, but I couldn't find it. I love that. But we got all kinds of skill gaps too, because what's happening is the people that we need are not the same type of people. We need much more technologically capable people, even in jobs that you would consider moderately skilled or unskilled. And our training and education system lends itself to going at a college degree when we need a lot more of what we used to call shop training. We need people who don't go to college but get a two-year degree or they go into an apprenticeship program, which, which we have too few of in America. Germany's got a great apprenticeship culture. We don't, although IBEW and some of the others are actually putting in great apprenticeship programs to bring up the skill set. And diversity. Over 50% of the women in the United States universities for electrical engineering degrees are like her. They are women. Amen. God bless America. It is absolutely wonderful that there's so many more women coming in and we need to do more of that. We need to look for that. And it's not diversity and inclusion for some political reason. It's better for everybody. It's better for, because we can't find enough of one, one group of people. We need geographic uh, forces because we need workers in areas where we may not have workers. Uh, union Asian and labor relations need to work together. Companies need to work together because blocks that unions put in or blocks that companies put in are just going to do nothing but uh, uh, exacerbate exacerbate the problem. I love that word. And then the the worst damage I've ever seen from a human being in my life was somebody who survived a high voltage shock. I know there are times that he and his family, it's hard to say, the wonder if he had not been better off had he not survived. It uh, Power goes in and it comes out anywhere it wants to and it destroys any organ in the body. But uh, the health and safety of electric power workers has to be the number one concern. And we do a great job of it, but we need to do a better job of it. That's why we have the safe it's Safety and Reliability Association, a 501c6 that a group of us has formed. Here's some of the answers. Smart grid technology. You can reduce these outages, EPRI says, just through innovation and doing all of these creative things. And that's for you. If you're an industrial uh, plant, if you're a CEO of a company that makes steel, if you do anything that uses high amounts of power, you better be prepared because you. I haven't even mentioned this one. One of the next big things that all of this DER creates, it creates a problem with power quality. Smart Grid, PG&E introduced it. They reduced their out outages by 25%. Energy stored, I, I said it's the future. It's expected to grow, but a great investment in it. But in 2020, uh, 2019, uh, Wooden McKenzie said, hey, it was going to grow up to 15 gigawatts by 2024. We are now at 50 gigawatts. I don't even know what their next calculation is, but energy storage is going to be one of the big answers. It is industrial scale. It is data center scale. The biggest problem with energy storage is how quickly you can bring it back on. Even a generator takes a while to kick in a bigger generator. And if that generator doesn't keep running because you don't have enough diesel fuel, you're in trouble. This energy storage is the future. I love what Australia is doing. So they took a lithium ion battery, which I don't particularly care for, but $116 million in savings. And this is not a big power reserve, just in their innovative approach to being able to do storage. When you start adding vanadium batteries and all kinds of other, I think the Sun Company, uh, a brilliant CEO, uh, Jolie has created a battery system that uh, that doesn't require lithium ion or vanadium or any, any other metal. Vanadium is not a rare earth. Lithium is, but there are people working on this diligently. 
And then blockchain for trading, AI, and predictive maintenance and reliability. Having a point so that the screen pops up and says, send out a crew to this one because you're going to have a failure. You're going to have a failure, not you had a failure. I love that. With that said, I've got to give you all time for questions. And uh, that was fast. And I went through a lot very quickly. So uh, I'm going to leave that open. Thank you so much for that, Mr. So, okay, um, thank you for sharing your valuable insights today. So before we move in to the Q&A session, I want to take this moment to spotlight the Adam FTD. Um, this is a robust um, platform developed by the ICTDM. If you're looking to streamline your trade compliance processes and enhance your market intelligence, Adam FTD offers an incredible suite of tools to keep your business competitive in the evolving global trade landscape. So for more details or to get started, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to connect with you um, with your appropriate resources. So we were now open the floor for the Q&A session. I, by the way, uh, and I've got a, a about that. If mm -hmm. you're doing it, if you are importing, if you're exporting and you want to export, if you go to the ITC, uh, FTD, I think, whatever I had just mentioned, it, it we, I mentioned regulations in the power industry, the regulations of the train industry for the countries or the communities that you want to you want to ship into and from what you can ship out, what you're changing every day, they've put together an amazing website that you can go to and see how it affects you. I would strongly recommend that if you're into uh, international trade, you go there and you make that one of your uh, stop two sites to make sure that you keep up with regulations and you keep up with opportunities. But anyway, that's a, a quick uh, thank you ITC from me. Thank you so much um, as well, Mr. Allen. So let's proceed to the Q&A session. So if there's anyone who would like to ask um, about the topic, um, you could type your question into the Q&A tab or on the chat box. So let's take a moment for everyone. So I have a question here. So what are the biggest challenges you face in the power industry, Mr. Allen? Biggest one, I think, that I've seen, because remember, I, I am both a, a, I own a media company which publishes information. That's not a challenge. That's a delight because <clears throat> we get to talk to the people who are fixing these things. We talk about the problem, then we talk about the solution. Um, go to APC dot. Uh, com and you'll you, you know, excuse me dot media apc dot media but the biggest challenge that that i have faced is um power quality uh, we were in a company that um, we demand we depended upon a very high level of power and we were getting intermittent transients and issues we didn't know what it was so we went back at the time it was first energy it was actually ohio uh, Ohio Edison, which was owned by First Energy. And we went back to them and said, look, we keep getting these glitches. And it's not just that the lights flicker, that our computer systems go down. Because when we get the glitch, it shuts down. When the computer system shuts down, order entry, production, everything shuts down. And we're not sure what it is. Literally, it took three years for them to determine that they were receiving power from a, uh, a wind farm near where we were, not not absolutely in the community, but near enough in there that when that wind was coming in, that the transients from that wind farm were creating more power quality issues that got through the grid and got to us. Now, here's what the utility said. We will get around to putting filters on that, 
but that is a, an industry-wide problem. And you're going to have to do something at your end to put filters on it. So, you know, what we did, we called a company called Schneider Electric. And Schneider Electric, no, no, this is a good company. Uh, that's what they look at. They come in to detect power quality issues and they mitigate them. And they came in and they put filters and we kind of mitigated that problem. But I thought about that and I thought about, I love wind and solar. I think it's brilliant. At the same time, I didn't know it would impact our daily operations and it did. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Allen. So let us, uh, we also have a question here from Mr. Billy. So the question is, what strategies can power companies adopt to overcome the intermittency issues of renewable energy sources like solar and wind? There's one word and it's already happening. It's called interoperability. So that means that the system all works as one with interoperability. Nobody wants a system that's a closed down system, meaning, hey, you buy my thing and I can't let you plug into everything else, right? It's interoperability and um, the utility industry, the distribution end of that. In fact, industrials need to get much more involved in interoperability. We just see a lot of people thinking, hey, you know, the power company's responsible for that. We own the, the, the system on our side of the fence. They own the system on the other side. Wrong. You need to start thinking about you own the power. When that power comes in, you own it and you've got to make sure it's not dirty power, it's clean power. And the word is interoperability. Look it up and you will see the incredible ways you can do it. You can do it through technology software. You can do it through te technology hardware. It should be and always should be open architecture means it's not anybody's one system. We see a lot of people buy my system and then it's a closed down, but nobody else can access your system. CEOs in the power industry are, are up. They're totally against these private systems, including of their own. Uh, and then the federal government is looking to help with regulations that open up interoperability. What comes with interoperability, though, is the potential for cyber. Because the more people that you have working together, and if you can see my fingers, they're doing this, the more somebody can access it. So you need advanced security in an interoperability system. That's what you can do. If you're a data center, if you're an industrial site, if you're a hospital, whatever it is, if you need power. I wanna make one more statement before we end at 11 o'clock on. So give me one minute to make an ending statement. Mm -mm. Okay, um, could you please share your any final thoughts? Yeah, let me, let me do this. I was uh, making a presentation recently and um, I looked out over the audience and I, I, I usually ask this of usually technical people, right? They are energy people, they're in the industry or they use power. And I asked them, I said, how many people here uh, are under 45 years old? Nine times out of 10, a year or two ago, I asked that question and, and you know, it'd be 20 to 30%. I went to this recent one. Um, so it was about, and, and it was amazing to me, these were, users at a user's uh, conference, right? So they were using uh, technology from a company to do it. And I asked the question, about 60% of the audience was under 45. Hallelujah. We're making the change to the next generation because my generation may not have all the answers. Things are changing so rapidly that you need to understand just the way that's the way it has always been done. Don't accept that as the way it always needs to be done. So the next generation needs to look at change and say, we ought to look at all of these wonderful things happening and we ought to embrace that change. And we're the generation that thinks digitally and we're the generation that will probably understand AI better than everybody else. That's number one. But I talked about the impact of the power industry. It's global. You know, Ill literacy, Ill excuse me, literacy, the ability to read in the world is at the highest it's ever been in history. And you know why? One thing, the light bulb. Where people can get power, they can get electricity, they can get a light, and they can read in a hut in Africa because they have a light. They can, they can charge a battery. They can do something with it. Power is essential to life, and it is incumbent on all of us to make sure that we 
secure the power grid and not just let it be somebody else's problem. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Allen. Um, we really, really appreciate uh, your efforts, you know, um, sharing your knowledge um, for this topic, for this kind of topic. So as we conclude, I'd, I'd like to share some important announcement for everyone that today's session has been recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel for the future references and for the non-members who attended today's webinar are eligible for a complimentary ITZ membership so don't miss this opportunity to become part of our community and lastly all of the participants will receive a certificate as well the speaker um of participation media dot me uh yeah apc dot media i struggle with my own with my own uh I'm trying to see where I put that in the chat box, but I can't see. It. Okay, it's but on anyway, the it's, on, it's on the last slide. If um, if you if they can get access to it, it's on the first and last slide. Alan Ross at APC Media. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Allen. So um, again, a sincere thank you to you for your experts insight today, and to all of the participants for the active engagement and the thoughtful questions which truly enhanced this webinar. So please do watch your email for the follow-up information, including how to claim the certificate. We wish you all a wonderful afternoon and look forward to seeing you at our future webinars. Goodbye for now, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you, Mr. Allen.